I dedicate today's class to my mother. Uh, may she live and be well. Everything we say in today's class, we're, we're going to be talking about the element of humility and then go into arrogance. My mother doesn't have one speck of arrogance in her body, not even a micro uh, speck, uh, nothing. We'll dedicate it in her honor. And that way will be, it'll be a, a great thing uh, to reinforce my mother's incredible dedication to all of her nine children. I'm one of nine, as many of you may know. I'm the third. You know, the first one is an extremist this way. The second one is an extremist that way. And the, the third one, you get them finally right. You know, you finally, you know exactly the right balance. I'm just kidding. My brothers are amazing. Every single one of them. My brothers, my sisters, I'm seven boys and two girls, five of which live in, in, in Jerusalem, four that live in the United States, two in New York, New Jersey, and two here in Houston. My mother was, you know, now she has, she's an empty nester. So it's a different life. My mother's house is always busy. It's always, still is always busy. It's odd. I spoke to my father last night and he said, it's odd that they don't have people at their house for Shabbos meals and they don't have guests coming in and out, which is the norm by my parents forever and ever. I mean, we grew up, you know, it was, it was a very normal thing that we had guests just show up at 11 o'clock at night and we had to, you know, have, my mother always had a guest room or two or three prepared. Always. It almost reminds me of a story from my wife's family side. There was a family in New York, they had like 24 children, of which uh, several were adopted as well. They had a home which was like unbelievably uh, welcoming for guests. And one time there was a guest who was there for a very, very long time. Now the guests, they had like a whole wing of the house, which was for guests. And people who would come to collect for charity from Israel would come and uh, stay there, you know, they knew it. it was an open place. It's an open house. You just come and, and go, and come and go. And people would just come and go. And they had a maid who would go in and clean out every day, you know, as if everyone was leaving. And it, they'd happen to come back the next night again, right? So one guy goes over to the, to the owner of the house. He didn't know it was the owner of the house. He just thought he was another one of the people over there who's staying in the guest house. He just saw him there. So he says to him, just tell me, do you know if they'll kick me out? I was here already for two months. Like nobody said anything to me. You think they're going to kick me out? He says, I have no idea. I've been here for over 20 years. They didn't kick me out. So, so that, that's, the, that's the type of home my parents have. I, I can tell you an amazing story. When my father was just recovering from his second, his second open heart surgery, he had a bypass, a triple bypass. And uh, he was uh, in the, you know, just waking up. Uh, just, you know, it's like you're all woozy and everything. And he gets a phone call and he has a cell phone next to his bed. So he picks up the phone. He has no idea who it is, a number he doesn't recognize. And the person calls him up and is asking if uh, he can stay by my parents' house coming from Israel for treatments. And my father, in all of his woozy and everything, he says, of course, just come over. No problem. You know, it's like not, not even, he's not even home, right? He doesn't and it was like, and when the person showed up, and I heard this from the individual, because when I came to be with my father at the hospital, I actually shared a room with this guest. And he says to me, you'll never believe it. He says, I had no idea that your father was just after surgery. And it, it was it sounded like the most normal thing. Like, of course, come right over. We're waiting for you. Open arms. He says, and he didn't have a chance with, in all his wooziness and, and waking up. He didn't have a chance to even tell my mother. He showed up at the house and my mother was like, this is totally normal. Of course, we, of course, we have a room for you. We're waiting for you. Like we have no, she had no idea, right? But that's the home that my parents were, were raised us in, a home that was always loving and caring for every single Jew, uh, no matter where they came from, no matter what their uh, religious background was. It didn't make any difference. If you're a Jewish person, you always had a place in our home. And uh, so I want to dedicate today's class to my amazing mother. And may she continue to stay strong and to be well and to be healthy. So we have a verse that we say in Psalms. It says, Hashem Malach Geut Lavish. Hashem rules, he kings the world, his, his kingship wears pride. And our sages tell us that if we walk around with pride, then we're, we're rejecting God. We can't wear God's clothes. It's God's world to be proud of what, what, what he has created. What do we have to be proud of? We have an accomplishment here. We have an accomplishment there. But we have to always recognize that it's Hashem's world. It's a bad trait for mankind. Arrogance is a very, very bad trait for mankind. Mm -hmm. Feeling superior over others, 
feeling higher than others. We gave last week at the end of class, we had uh, brought the example of the Titanic. I don't know if it was in this class or a different class, but the great catastrophe of the Titanic was that they said, even God can't drown this ship, right? It is so powerful, such a, such a, a behemoth. It cannot, uh, such a monster uh, a ship, even God can't drown the ship. And that is a very, very terrible trait. It's bad trait and its source, the source is the foundation for most negative traits, right? Arrogance is rooted in low self-esteem. When a person is arrogant, it's because they don't feel whole with themselves. And if one who doesn't feel whole with themselves has to talk a lot and show off a lot and, and, and be out um, one-upping everybody else. The need to feel bigger than others by making them smaller is a very, very terrible thing. There are many ways that a person can, can grow, but the healthy way to grow is to grow on your own, right? Meaning that I'm going to work on myself and be better. I'm going to work on myself and overcome this. I'm going to work on myself and overcome that, right? Anyone who has any fear, you have a fear of jumping into a cold pool and you're able to overcome that fear. Wow, you've, you've done something, right? You, you wanted to say something nasty about somebody, but you held your mouth closed, right? The sages tell us unbelievable reward that one gets for such a thing. To be able to control oneself it really is an incredible thing. So the, that the one way of growing is really taking ourselves up the, the ladder step by step. But there's another way that people mistakenly think that they can grow in. And that is by putting other people down. If I mock other people, if I laugh at other people, if I put other people down, then I'll be growing. I'll be bigger. I'll be that's wrong and it's 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 a very it's a very terrible thing because our sages tell us that okay i'll just tell you in a very interesting talmud the talmud says that anybody anybody who keeps their mouth closed they lock their mouth and doesn't say something embarrassing about someone else you want to say something oh i've got a a tear on somebody i've got a line on somebody i will and you hold your mouth shut and you don't embarrass them, you get the most unbelievable reward of the world to come. The most unbelievable reward of the world, right? The most unbelievable reward. Why? You could have put someone else down and you didn't. That's the highest level of a, of a human being is that when it's, there's, there's another, another great virtue is if a person is embarrassed by somebody and doesn't respond, right? So if you're in synagogue and someone laughs at you or, or mocks you or or embarrasses you with words, right? Or any any in any way, and you just don't respond, right? All of your sins are forgiven. All of your sins are forgiven. That's a pretty powerful one. You almost like want people to embarrass you, right? No, 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 no. Not a great thing because it's embarrassing. It, it, we're human beings and we right, but all of a sin, all of one's sins could be forgiven. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but I think it, it's worthwhile. I think in the beginning, the first class that we spoke about, humility. I mentioned this, and that is in the song of Eshet Chayil that we mentioned, the aforementioned Eshet Chayil, we said, Sheker hachein vehevel hayofi. Isha yirat Hashem hiti talal. Sheker hachein, I'll give you the actual translation here from the Siddur, is as follows. Charm is deceptive and beauty is vain. It is the God-fearing woman who deserves praise. Okay? So one who has charm. Charm, is that something that you work on to earn? Anybody here work on the trait of charm? No. You either have it or you don't. How about beauty? Anybody work on becoming more beautiful? No, it is what it is. God gives you who you are, and you're either beautiful or you're not. Right? Thank God everyone here has been gifted, right, with beauty, right? <laughs> but is that something to walk around and feel all proud? Look at me. I'm so beautiful. Well, what did you do to, to, to attain that? Nothing. That's a gift from Hashem. But someone who has a trait, let's say, of arrogance, and they're able to work on themselves to remove that arrogance. Someone has a trait of jealousy, and they're able to work on themselves to remove that jealousy. Someone has a, tr a trait of stinginess, and they're able to work on them themselves and not be stingy anymore. Such a person is praiseworthy, our sages tell us. That is a true accomplishment. That is a true attainment of a, of a positive trait that the Torah recognized that is praiseworthy right and it's so 
important for us to remember this. We think of think of uh, people. You have these beauty contests and people walking around feeling like they own the world, right? What have they done to accomplish zero? And many people, you know, feel proud of their of their wealth or feel proud. What did they do to accomplish that? For most people, it's marrying the right person, right? It, it's marrying the right person or being at the right place at the right time for a business deal or sometimes just not being that stupid, right? It's an amazing thing that financial success has absolutely nothing to do with brains. King Solomon already says this. He says, Lo lechem. He says, it's, bread doesn't go to the wise. But we think success, financial success goes to, oh, he's so bright. He's brilliant. Look at him on Wall Street. Look at him and how he does his business dealings. Look at, right, real estate. I can tell you many, many people who are brilliant and can't put food on their table. And I can tell you many people who are not very intelligent, who have made unbelievable fortunes. And it has nothing to do with the amount of brains you have. So for a person to walk around and feel like he's so wealthy, he's so successful, I want to read to you a phrase from the Ramban. The Ramban, uh, Nachmanides, writes in his incredible letter to his son. He writes the most remarkable words. Listen to these words. He says, the Ata Dabini. He says, so let me go, I'll go back a little bit, okay? He says, what do you need to do to attain the trait of humility, which humility is the greatest trait of all traits? The greatest trait of all traits is humility, okay? So the first thing you need to do is remove anger. When you remove anger, how do you remove anger? We mentioned this previously, is you learn to you train yourself to speak in a soft tone. And the more you're able to speak in a soft tone, the greater your anger will dissipate. Your anger will disappear. And as soon as your anger gets removed from your uh, toolkit, right? So what, what comes in its place? Humility. Which is the best trait of all the good traits is humility. Okay. Because the verse states, the outcome of humility is fear of God. And that's what we're, we're going trying. What we're trying to do is get into that world of relationship with God. Okay, he goes, he goes further into this, into this, this idea of what, what happens here. The Mishnah tells us in, in ethics of our fathers, we have to always remember from where we're from, right? Where are we going to? And that essentially, what are we, what are we made of? We're made of earth. Right. We come from the earth. We return to the earth. Right. And at the end of the day, we're going to give judgment in front of the almighty king, creator of heaven and earth. He says, and when you do conduct yourselves with proper humility, and to have a shyness and to be a little bit embarrassed in front of other people. Why? Why? Why should we be embarrassed of other people? Because look at how much this person accomplished and look how little I accomplished, right? Look, Hashem gave me so much skill, so much talent, and what did I do with it, right? I wrote a book, right? Maybe I should have written 20 books, right? He says, and it's it's an unbelievable thing. He says, listen, my son, okay? Know and see this. Someone who is arrogant over other people he is rebelling against the creator of heaven and earth. Because he is using God's garments for himself. What is a person going to be arrogant about? So here's, the, here's why I brought this. So listen very carefully. What is one going to be arrogant about? Want to hear this? Unbelievable. Imb Osher, wealth. You're so wealthy. Look at me. I'm so wealthy. Look at my car that I drive. Look at the house that I live in. Look at the vacations that I go on. Look at me. I'm so successful. Hashem Morishomashir says, uh, Samuel, the great says, don't forget wealth. Wealth doesn't come from you. Wealth comes from Hashem. Hashem is the one who makes someone wealthy or someone poor. Okay. The Imbikavod, and if with honor, Hello, Lelo Kimu. God, uh, the honor belongs to God. That the wealth 
and the honor is before you. How can we take of our God's uh, garments? How can we take of his possessions? And if you are so bright and so smart and you're, you take honor, you, you, you show off how bright you are, don't forget that the Almighty is the one who gives wisdom and takes wisdom. How many brilliant people in one second lost their intelligence, right? They can have a, a God forbid, an aneurysm. They can have a, a, a medical event that takes away all their wisdom like that. Who gives it to man? God. Who takes it from man? God. The Nachmanides is telling his son, so by what measure does man have a right to be arrogant? It's all Hashem's. Okay. He says, Nimso, we see from here, I call shovel if Everything is equal in front of the Almighty. Because with his will, he's able to humble those who are arrogant to And with his will, in one moment, he's able to erect the humble and stand them up tall. He says, therefore, stay humble so that the Almighty will carry you. The Almighty will carry you, so to speak. On his wings, you will be able to fly. He says, but let me tell you even more than that. He says, if you're wise and you're wealthy, you right? And you're thinking to yourself, look at this person. He's not as smart as me. He's not as wealthy as me. He says, no, 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 no. Don't be arrogant. He says, you have to honor him. You have to honor the person who is, right? You have to honor the person who is less fortunate than you. He says, why? He says, because if he's poor, he's not obligated to give charity. You are obligated to give charity. You're obligated to give much more than him. Are you perhaps not fulfilling your, your measure? Right? So your obligation is greater. If you're so wise, you, you should be using your mind for all great things. Are you perhaps not using your mind for all those great things? Hashem gave you such great abilities. Hashem gave you such great talents. Perhaps you're not using your great abilities and talents the way you're supposed to. But him being a poor person, when he gives a few little pennies to charity, he's giving more than his share. So he's fulfilling his task, and you're not. So be very careful before you're arrogant before someone who has less than you. Be very careful. You know what? For his limited intelligence, he's maximizing it. For your great intelligence, perhaps you are not using enough of it. And it's such an important principle. Our sages warn us, be so careful before you be arrogant about another, about, over another person because they don't have the same obligations that you do. Why don't they have the same obligations that you do? Because they don't have the same abilities as you do. And because you have greater abilities, you'll be held more accountable. So this whole trait of arrogance, we have to be very, very careful. Me feeling greater than somebody else Oh, look at them. Guess what? Let me ask you a question. You know, you can think about people who, uh, who grow up in different countries and you can, you can say, ah, third world country. You can say something, you know, disparaging about someone else, right? But we have to remember, because we grew up in such privileged homes, we grew up in a privileged society where today a poor person in the United States, a poor person living on social, on welfare programs, still has more than most kings had 200 years ago. You have telephones, you have televisions, you have medicine, you have transportation, right? This is given out for welfare, for people who are impoverished, people who are poor. The greatest kings 200 years ago didn't have that. They didn't have a doctor at their beck and call whenever they wanted. So today, right? We think about this and we come from, from the background and we, 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 we can, right? It only holds us more accountable where we should be saying to ourselves, uh-oh, God gave me so much more. How am I going to utilize this more? How am I going to do more with what I have? Because I was gifted all these gifts, right? For free. God is going to hold me accountable and say, hey, what did you do with this? I gave you so much ability. What did you do? What did you do to make the world a better place? What did you do to make the world closer, to bring the world closer, to, 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 to bring Hashem closer to his, to his people? Chashov belibcha, this is the, the, the Nachmanides. 
Think in your heart, ki ata chayev mimenu v'hu zakanimcha. You are more obligated than he, and he is more meritorious than you. Shimhu chotehu shogeg v'at amazing. If he sins, if he doesn't do things properly, for him it's an innocent mistake. For you, it's intentional because you have the ability, you have the wisdom, you have the the capability of uh, doing such great things, and they don't. So you're held more accountable. So I think it's an unbelievable pers- perspective that Nachmanides is sharing with us to uh, keep us in check that we should not think for a second that we are greater than other people. Before we start being all arrogant and thinking that we're so capable and we're so talented, don't forget, says Nachmanides to his son in, in this incredible letter, he says, don't forget that you're more obligated. Why are you more obligated? Because you were gifted more. You were given more talent. Let me ask you a question. Uh, as an adult, as a parent, we know not all of our children are the same. Not all of our children are the same. Not all, right? So if you're a teacher in a school or if you're, right, so you have a child who has 100% brain power. And you have another child who's gifted only with 10% brain power. But the child who get, who's only gifted 10% maximizes his 10%. And the child who has 100 uh, grams of ability only maximizes 10. So who is who, who are you prouder of? The one who has 10 and utilizes 10? Or the one who has 100 and utilizes 10? They're both the same. But obviously, the one who has 100 and only utilizes 10 is falling short of their abilities. And that's what Nachmanides is telling us. He's telling us that we are obligated not to be what everybody else is doing as long as everybody's on the same place. No, 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 no. You're obligated to be the best that you can be. And God gave you 100 grams of ability. He expects you to utilize 100 grams of your ability. Not to say, you know what? It's norm. You know, it's what the, uh, you know, the, the median uh, 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 level is at. And that's what I'm good with. I'm good with average. But God gave you more than average. He gave you more than average ability. Average isn't good enough for you. As an individual, average is not good enough for you. Right? To just do what's okay for everybody else. You know, they have this, this chart they use in medicine of, of where the, uh, the average is for height and where the average is for weight and where the average is for, for, for development. Right? Guess what? That does not apply. When it comes to the talents, the skills, the abilities, the traits of a human being. If God gives you the traits to be kind, 100 grams, and you only utilize 10. If God gives you 100 pounds of of ability to give charity and you only utilize one, right? Then, well, that's what the average is. That's what people are doing. That's what the norm is today, right? doesn't go by the norm of other people. It goes by what God gave you. And we are all going to be held accountable by ourselves. It's an interesting thing. My father drilled this into our head. It's almost Father's Day, but I'll share it on Mother's Day. He would always say to us that when we stand in front of the Almighty, we stand alone. We don't stand with our friends. We don't stand with our neighbors. We don't stand with our fellow congregants. We don't stand with anybody. That means that we ourselves are accountable for our own decisions. But everybody, when you look around, and not everybody's there. Nobody's there. It's just me standing in front of the Almighty God. I can't say, well, this was the norm. This is what everybody did. God says, I, I didn't give everybody the talents I gave you. I gave you unique, special talents. Why didn't you maximize your ability? We're going to be held accountable for what we were gifted with for what we were capable of. And that is our responsibility. All right, so I want to share with you now a very interesting idea. I believe this is from my grandfather. He says, what's the process of arrogance? How does arrogance develop in a person? He says, it says, says, man's nature is to live his essence, okay? So let's think about it for a second. A baby who starts to walk feels, look at me, look at my ability, my strength, my ability that I'm able to walk. Right? As he grows, so does his ability, his knowledge, 
right? His essence grows. And then stage three, this feeling grows till the person loses their perspective of their own essence and self-worth, right? It gets to a, a point where they, where they forget who they really are. They forget of what their capabilities are. And then the stage four, he forgets and disregards his own dependence or help of others. He forgets about his parents. He forgets about his, his uh, teachers. And then stage five is ultimately he feels that there's nothing else but himself. You see, a baby cries because he realizes I can't do anything on my own. I need to eat. So who do I cry for? I cry for my mother. My mother comes help me, helps me. And then eventually they start walking. They start saying, hey, you know, I can do some things on my own. And then it goes step after step after step till they completely disregard any, any help from anyone, nobody. And that's why we have a day like Mother's Day. Again, I told you I, I don't like the day of Mother. I don't like Mother's Day because I believe every day should be Mother's Day. Not only Sunday in May decided arbitrarily should be the day, right? But I think every single day should be Mother's Day. And we should acknowledge where we come from. We should acknowledge our parents, our fathers, and our mothers every single day. We should utilize every moment we have to acknowledge and appreciate where we come from. And if we have a teacher that has taught us great things, we should acknowledge that teacher and thank that teacher for getting us to where we are today. If we had someone who did a great miracle for us, we should acknowledge and thank them. The first thing that a person needs to do is to get to know themselves. The first task that we have in all of our work of Musa is get to know ourselves. We gave out a sheet. If you don't have it, I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, you can email me at awolby at torchweb.org. Um, I will happily send you. It's a get to know yourself sheet. And basically, it's each trait, positive and negative. I, I, I arbitrarily selected 13 common positive traits, 13 common negative traits. The idea is like this, is once you get to know your traits, many people are afraid to know their traits. And the reason they're afraid, because if they feel if I know that I'm selfish, then that'll be a terrible thing because it makes me bad, right? If I know that I, that I have a temper, a bad temper, right, that we, that'll make me a bad person. No, it's not going to change anything. It is who you are. That is your package that God gave you. But now what it does do is it empowers you and gives you the ability to work on it, right? When you know that you have this many ounces of kindness and you're not utilizing it, so you know, okay, you know what? This is a trait I need to work on. This is a trait I need to excel at. And I need to up my usage of this trait, whether it be, again, there are so many beautiful traits that God endowed us with. And that's what we need to do is A, identify them and then put together a plan of how we're going to perfect them. That sheet will hopefully help just identify them. And don't, don't rush it, right? Take your time. You're a young man. You have still many, 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 many years to work on it. But don't rush into, well, uh, you know, just what basically what it is, is it's these 13 positive, 13 negative traits. And it's one to 10. How strong are you or how weak are you in each of these traits? It's private. It's your document, right? You can write that you're, you know, and be honest, be honest. You know what? I am a kind person, right? You can mark yourself a six, a seven, an eight. But the idea is we want to get to a 10 in each of those traits. We want to be as strong as possible in each of those traits to identify, A, what they are, and B, put together a plan of how we're going to get to, to attain perfection in each of those traits. So if a person doesn't recognize that laziness is one of their negative traits, they'll never be able to work on it. But the minute we identify, you know what, I've got an issue with laziness, now it'll be an extra motivation and an extra impetus for me every morning to jump out of bed because I know this is a negative trait I've got to overcome. But if we don't take stock in an inventory of our traits ever, then we're never going to be able to work on them. So that is the, what we're trying to do is not run away from who we are, but run to ourselves, run to who we really are, because we're the most incredible person you will ever meet. And the same for each and every one of us, the most remarkable person you will ever meet is yourself. And that's what we're trying to do, right? My grandfather has a chapter in his book, which is called Know Thyself, Dat Atzmenu, Know Yourself. And the whole, the whole chapter goes into identifying who are 
you, right? Who am I? What are my strengths? What are my, what are my weaknesses? How do I identify my, tra my traits? How do I identify my own self? And it's critically important for us to have this tool, this in, in our toolkit of being able to identify, you know something? I just finished that conversation with someone. I wasn't right. It wasn't, it wasn't proper the way. I, I'll, let me tell you an amazing story. If you want to hear about a great Muster person, my uncle, I have an uncle who lives in Brooklyn, New York. He is the spiritual leader of the Mir Yeshiva in Brooklyn. I once went to be when his wife, my, my aunt, a blessed memory, uh, when she was very, very ill, we visited New York. And I said, I said, told my children, we have to go and visit my aunt. And we came in. It was a Friday afternoon. It was right before Shabbos. We were on our way to a family simcha. And I said, we have to go in and say, and say good Shabbos. And who knows how many more opportunities we'll have. And indeed, this was the second to last time that I saw my aunt. And uh, my uncle was very, very busy. He had like three nurses there in the kitchen with my, with one of my cousins. And then, and he just, uh, with the doctor on the phone, with the pharmacy on the phone, trying to get certain medications. And it was so hectic. And, you know, I realized it wasn't a good time for us to be there. So I took my children and we, we had left. The next time I came, I made sure that it was a calm time for us to come. And I came and I was able to see my aunt. And that was the last time I saw her. And my uncle opened up an entire table for us. You know, he put out cakes and he put out drinks and he put out and I said, my uncle, I said, we, we just came to say hello. We just wanted to see my, my aunt. And I just want to, you know, this is not necessary. You don't have to, you got to take care of her. You know, she was in, in, in a very serious stage at the time. And I, 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 I was uncomfortable. He says, no, 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 no. He says, I wanted to apologize. He says, last time you came, it was so hectic here. And I didn't properly welcome you to our home. I didn't properly care for you and, and take the time. He says, and I wanted to ask forgiveness. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of us, right, have a hectic day? Someone walks into our office, right? And we say, I'm sorry, just get out. Not, not now, leave, right? This is not a good time for this, right? How many times do we go back and say, you know something? I'm so sorry. It, it was wrong. It, I, I wasn't, you know, in the right frame of mind. I was busy. Take, and it could be justified. Again, he's taking care of his wife who was hanging between life and death. Right, dealing with medications, dealing with doctors, dealing with the pharmacy, dealing with the nurses, dealing with all of these things, it's very justified that he didn't have the time. But you know what he did as a Musser master? He did what every person should do is at that night before he went to sleep, he took an accounting of it as a, of his entire day and he said, You know something? I didn't act appropriately with that person. My nephew came to visit me from Houston, Texas, and I didn't give him the proper time of day. I didn't acknowledge his presence. I don't need anything special, but he knew that for himself, this wasn't appropriate. For himself, that's not the way he welcomes people into his home. And therefore, he wanted to have an opportunity to redo it, right? That is what I'm talking about. Because when he evaluated his traits and knowing his traits the way he knows himself, he said, this is unbecoming of me for himself he's talking about, and I need to, I need to make it up. I need to fix it, right? That is a Musser master. That is someone who knows his traits, who knows his qualities, knows his flaws, knows and is constantly evaluating himself. How do I become a better person? And that's the goal of each and every one of us is how do we enhance ourselves to become the best person we can be? And I guarantee you, there'll be some things that will be so delightful. You'll be like, you know, I never even realized that I'm, I'm, I'm really good in this trait. And you'll see some of the negative traits, sadly, right? We're all, we all, uh, just aside for Uncle Lenny, I don't know anybody here who's perfect, right? Everybody's got positive traits, amazing positive traits, and everybody's got some negative traits, right? That's the way Hashem created us. Hashem created us as a package. I'll give you an example, okay? Coffee, is coffee good? Well, coffee is great, but too much coffee is not good for you. So there has to be a balance, right? Candy. Candy could be good. Candy could be terrible. It's excellent for dentists. So you, you have on every side, you always have everything that is, is positive and it has, it has a negative aspect to it. There has to be a balance. Only a, a person who works on themselves and nobody has it by mazel. You can't pass the Musser test, right, by mazel. Oh, just so happens to be I locked out and God gave me only the good traits and not the bad traits. No such thing. 
every person is a full package, uh, a, a beautiful uh, a bouquet of positive and negative traits. And we have to identify what are those positive traits? What are those negative traits so that we can work on them and become a better person? Okay. As someone gets more educated, the more confident they feel with their knowledge. Me, I'm a doctor, right? It's very rare that you find people uh, who have succeeded in the world of the intelligentsia, right? Who are willing to be honest and, and, and say, you know something? We're limited in our knowledge, right? I, one of the questions I've asked this to dozens and dozens of doctors, I ask them, tell me, how much do you feel we actually know about the human body? And the honest ones will tell you, we hardly know anything. I mean, we understand the basic how things function just about. We don't know why things happen. We don't know how things happen, but we know that they, that they happen in certain ways. We know, that, you know, this produces that and this produces that. And Okay, great. But do we really know how it happens? And I'll, I'll give you a proof to it. If you, we knew exactly the functions of the human body, and we knew how to heal properly, you would never have a side effect on the bottle of a medication that says may cause, may cause dizziness, make, may make you suicidal, may, uh, right? They have all of these, a list of 30 things that may happen. If we understood how medicine worked, you wouldn't have any of these. But the reality is, is that we're, we're really shooting in the dark. We tried it on 100,000 people. Only three of them died. So uh, we assume, and most of them were healed. So we assume that this works. Why it works? We don't know why it works. But we'll keep on mixing different ingredients until we come up with something that works. But then there are other ingredients that we put in there that could be damaging. So again, they're, they're, you're always playing with that. There's only one perfect answer, and that's the Almighty God, right? There, there used to be, very interestingly, the Talmud tells us that there was a book of healing. And that book of healing uh, had the cures for all illnesses. But that was, book was hidden. In the time of the Messiah, that book of healing will be revealed again. And all of the sick people will be healed. Imagine you turn on the television and God forbid anybody who's stricken with this disease or with this illness or with that, right? This is what you need to do and you'll be healed. Wow, that'd be amazing. Let's see what Johnson & Johnson would do. Let's see what all of these pharmaceutical companies will do. You just publish that book, right? And all of the healings, anything you have, any ailments, boom, any disease. So why was that book hidden? That book was hidden, say our sages. That book was hidden because the purpose of illness was to awaken a person to connect to God. And people stopped using illness as a tool. Someone would get sick. So what would they do? They would go to the prophet who had the book of healing. And they would say, so tell me, I, I have this uh, back pain. What do I do? I have this headache. What do I do? I have this, you know, whatever illness they had. And he would say, okay, page 632. Okay, this is what you need to do. And the person would just continue on his merry way. One second, what was the purpose of illness? The purpose of illness was to awaken a person to connect to God. And people stopped doing that. So I think it was Chizkiyahu Amelech, the king, hid that book and said that, the world wasn't able to continue getting having the tools for healing because they skipped the purpose of the illness. So it's a whole nother topic. We can get into it another time. We have to understand that that is the, the if you want to know, the real answer is Hashem. Hashem has the answer for everything. So what changes a person? Torah study. Torah study removes physical desires, but doesn't remove necessarily arrogance and the desire for honor only grows when someone learns Torah, right? Look at me, I'm such a scholar. Look at me, I'm so wise. Look at me, right? I'll tell you an amazing thing. When I, I mentioned this earlier in one of the classes, but uh, it's just such an incredible story. When I was in yeshiva, I asked my grandfather, me and a group, we were working on, on different traits together. And uh, we went to my grandfather, we asked him, how do we work on the trait of arrogance? So my grandfather said, the trait of arrogance says, you, you guys don't have anything to worry about arrogance. He says, as soon as you, you get married, your wife will take care of it for you. That is a quote from my grandfather. He was um, a very wise man. A wise, mature person doesn't kid themselves to believe that they're immune to this, to this weakness or this trait of arrogance. Okay, Gava, which means arrogance is a trait that needs constant work. 
It can always creep back into our lives during all stages of life. So when a person is a teenager, they can be arrogant and then they become a, a, you know, they become a young adult. They can get, they can have arrogance. They get married. They can have arrogance. They become a parent. They can have arrogance. They become a grandparent. They can have arrogance. They own their own business. They can have arrogance. They become a great grandfather. They can have arrogance at every stage of life. A person has to work on it. It's not a one fix solution that, oh, I worked on my arrogance five years ago, I'm good. No, it's, a, it's something that constantly needs to be reinforced for a person to remove that infection known as arrogance. It's a very interesting thing that the sages say that bilvavi mishkan evne, I should build a tabernacle within my heart, right? That's the, that's the craziest thing. So we know that the Aron, the ark, was the receptacle for the Torah. In order for a person to become a receptacle for Torah, they need good character traits. That's why we say, make our heart a receptacle, make our heart like the Mishkan, like the tabernacle, which had within it the Torah. It, without the proper traits, we are unable to absorb the Torah. How does that work? It's a very interesting thing. Do you know? that if you went into the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies, I'm just going to give arbitrary numbers just so that you can understand. Uh, okay, but imagine you'd go from wall to wall, okay, it would be 20 feet. And you go to other wall to wall, it'd be 20 feet. So it's 20 by 20, right? Okay, but then if you went, and what was in the middle of that room of the Holy of Holies? The Ark. The Ark was 10 by 10. So how much room do you have on the sides? You have five on each side, right? You have five here, five here, and 10 for the ark. And that would equal the 20 of the room. But that's not the way it added up. There was a miracle in the Holy of Holies that if you took your tape measure and you went from the wall to the ark, it would equal 10. And you went from the other side, and it would equal 10. And you took the whole distance, it equal 20. What happened? Because the ark symbolized humility. What is humility? It takes no space. The Torah embodies humility. And if we have proper humility, we don't take any space in the room. We let everybody else shine. We there's room for everybody else. That to the point where we are like the ark, we are the receptacle of the Torah. That takes no space from anybody else. The ark, if you measured, was an unbelievable miracle. It took no space. And that's what we are capable of being. We are capable of being just like the ark that took no space. A person has several opportunities for strengthening their humility every day. Number one, we said previously, prayer in which one humbles himself before Hashem by asking for our needs. It is clear recognition that everything is from Hashem and not from our own doing. Number two. So if someone is arrogant, it's very difficult for them to pray. What are they praying for? Uh, I'm, I'm able to do everything on my own. I don't need any help from God. No, when we recognize that we need Hashem's help, that we need God's help, we realize our limitations. So one of the great tools to enter into a world of humility is prayer. We go and we are able to go and pray and say, Hashem, I need your help. That means we're showing our limitations. That's a great thing. Number two, during our learning with recognition that we don't know it all, and more importantly, to humbly accept the opinion of someone else, right? When it differs from ours, the very concept of joint study brings about humility. Learn to admit when you're wrong, even when it hurts. So admitting, to someone else's logic, admitting to someone else's understanding, you know what? You're right. That is an act of humility, that we're realizing our limitations. And then another tool, a person must have someone before whom they humble themselves. With this, they gain an appreciation of their limitations, of their smallness, right? Again, we're great, capable human beings. Right. As mankind, God gave us unbelievable abilities, but we have limitations. 
And that is what we're trying to recognize. We're trying to recognize our limitations. When we realize that we are not superior to other people, but more obligated than other people. If you have more brains than other people, don't be busy showing off. Oh, I'm smarter. I got this on my, on, my, on my score. I got that on my test. I got this on a, I graduated at the top of, guess what? It only makes you more obligated. Like Nachmanides tells us in his letter to his son, having more money obligates you to help more. Having more brains obligates you to think more. Having more talent obligates you to use it more. So just because you're better than someone doesn't make you great, right? You could be well, well below what God is expecting of you because you're not living up to your expectations of what God expects from you, right? This is so important for us to understand Again, how closely time. linked arrogance and its opposite, humility, are. If a person doesn't understand that everything is a gift from Hashem, that I am obligated to fulfill my personal duties that the Almighty has charged me with, Right? And if I don't, guess what? I'll be held accountable. It is crucial that a person focus on their arrogance, particularly in marriage and in business. Because if a person doesn't check themselves, they can destroy relationships in marriage and they can destroy relationships in business. Right? It is critically important for a person to constantly check themselves. You know what? Take a step back. Your arrogance can ruin your relationship. Your arrogance can ruin your business, your livelihood. It is imperative that we always keep our own arrogance in check, right? This trait runs deep, right? It's like Chevy. That's their advertisement, runs deep, right? Uh, we have to be very, very careful, right? We have to be very, very careful that we are keeping this in check. You know, it says, then shall the Kohen command to take for the person to be cleansed two living clean birds and cedarwood and red wool and hyssop, right? This is regarding the Mitzorah. Why does the Mitzorah specifically take these items? Rashi explains, since he spoke Lashon Hara and was high like a cedar tree, which grows tall and imposing, symbolizing haughtiness, he must lower himself like a worm, like a tolat, a crimson thread is dyed with the pigment made by the lowly creature. And a hyssop, an azo, is a lowly bush, also symbolizes humility. Why is it necessary for him to use two symbolic items to bring him to humility? The tola chani and the azo, wouldn't it be driven to this point with one? So the great Maskil David says, although by other traits, by other character traits, we say that a person should take the middle road not going to an extreme on either end of the spectrum. However, concerning arrogance, haughtiness, our sages tell us, me'od, me'od, one should be exceedingly humble. And for this reason, we use two symbols of humility in this offering that the Mitzorah brings to stress that the Mitzorah should be exceedingly humble to atone his sin, right? When we talk about humility, we don't say the middle of the road is fine. With all other traits, we say the middle of the road is fine, except for arrogance. The Rambam tells us arrogance is with that one exception that you go to the opposite extreme. Go all the way, run away from arrogance because there is never a good usage of arrogance. And one needs to completely eradicate this trait. You know, you think of, of Moses. Moses was anav me'od mikol adam. He was very, very humble, more than any man. How can Moses be considered the humble of all men and yet write it in the Torah? Right? The reason is, our sages tell us, because he was so close to the Almighty, he re recognized his limitations. He recognized what he was able to do and what he wasn't able to do. When he had a shortcoming, Moses realized it was a shortcoming. And when he had a talent, he didn't see it as a way to show off over other people, but rather as an obligation, not as a, a way to be boastful. But he realized this is an, a, a privilege and an opportunity that I must utilize because I'll be held accountable for it.